Welcome to the Risk and Repeat podcast, episode number 234. I'm Rob Wright, Security News Director at Tech Target, and I am here with Senior Security News Writer Alex Kalafi. Alex, welcome. Thanks, Rob. How are you doing on this fine Tuesday? Um, I think we jinxed ourselves by talking about how slow the news was the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, because in every facet of the universe, uh, there has been crazy news. <laughs> yes. Yes. There's Including been... security. Yes. And there's right, right. Yeah. Uh yeah, some some pretty big stories over the last week or so. But we're gonna talk about just one of them. Well, I guess. I take that back. We'll talk about, I guess, two of them, Uh, Mm -hmm. one more so than the other. We're going to start with AT&T. This seems like a a pretty significant incident attack. So AT&T, obviously the telecom giant, on Friday disclosed a data breach. And... It was a pretty significant data breach. They disclosed that a threat actor had illegally downloaded, had had stolen some customer data from a third party platform, and that the comp- compromised data included records of all calls and texts between May 1st, 2022, and October 31st. 2022, you know, six month period approximately for nearly all cellular customers. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. And I know it's a small window, a small window of time, I guess. You're talking about a lot of records for a lot of people. And they said, in addition to the cellular customers, uh, also affected were customers of their mobile virtual network, um, customers of mobile virtual network operators that use AT&T's wireless network, and some AT&T landline customers who interacted with the compromised cellular numbers in that six month period. And they said there was also some stolen data that included call and text records from January 2nd, 2023, for a very small number of customers, quote unquote. It's not sure why that single day is included in that data batch, but who knows. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we found out that this stemmed from the Snowflake attacks, the uh, attacks by a cyber criminal group uh, tracked as UNC5537 that had targeted Snowflake database customers and had gotten into their cloud database instances, uh, primarily targeting customers, Snowflake customers that did not have MFA or two-factor authentication enabled on their instances. Uh, Alex. Yes. You you wrote about the aftermath of these attacks just recently, uh, specifically what Snowflake did in response to these attacks, because I think we're we're talking dozens of companies now have been impacted. Uh, I believe Google Mandian had said, they say a hundred, hundred plus hundred. Well, it's like one sixty five or something was okay. the number, but there it was over one fifty. Yes. So what did Snowflake do? Also last week, correct? Yes. Um. Yes, it was last week. Um. Middle of last week, they announced that they were um, enabling new features to allow customer admins to enforce multi-factor authentication um, at their user base level. So if you're a company that's a customer of Snowflake, um, your admin through the company can can decide to enforce uh, MFA. Um, this includes the introduction of tools that will allow you to monitor who has MFA enabled so you can track it. Um, It is optional, but uh, um, I guess in the future, they said near future, new human Snowflake users, regardless of the company's preference, um, will have MFA enforced. Interesting. Yeah. Which is, so it's it's sort of like... um, 
a th- not like a half measure or not a full measure, but like a three quarters measure, how you'd almost call it, because um, Snowflake has all these identity based attacks, you know, not necessarily their fault based on what we know so far. Maybe they should have had uh, a higher priority placed on MFA before, but but it's this is the way they did things was pretty normal. So it's not on them strictly that they didn't have this elaborate uh mfa situation like that's more of an industry problem than a snowflake problem Mm. um but basically existing customers their admins are going to get to choose whether human users um have mfa enabled and enforced um and the big thing here is that like they'll be able to manage and, and track that easier um, but in the future, new human users are going to get to. So it's it's one of those like we don't want to make our our customer base mad um, mm-hmm. for those who don't want to enable MFA, and yet it's also a slightly weird look at the same time because it's like it's almost like so what it, it, if if the customer gets mad that they are cut that their employee has to use two-factor authentication on a critical database. <laughs> I don't know. Is that... Yeah. Like... Well, yeah, I mean, you talked to some folks... <laughs> you, you, I don't... Yeah. Yeah, you mm-hmm. talked to some folks who, who kind of had similar sentiments about this. It's like, on one hand, you don't want to... Especially if you're not an enormous company and you want to create the best user experience because you want to grow your business and you don't want to lose people and you don't want to lose users. Uh, Mm -hmm. It can be a tricky tightrope to walk and you don't want to make MFA required across the board necessarily. If you think that's going to upset customers and create an, 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 a cumbersome user experience. Um, Mm -hmm. But at the same, the same time you're, you're right. I, I saw the news and I said, good, but, mm. and I, I thought about all the companies that had started to roll out MFA requirements like AWS, uh, Microsoft's uh, GitHub in order to prevent identity-based attacks, compromise credentials, protecting users, essentially protecting users from themselves. I know other mm-hmm. companies have, have have turned on MFA or two-factor authentication by default. So like when you sign up for an account, it's enabled. And if you don't want it, you, the customer, have to turn it off. I guess I was kind of expecting maybe something more along the lines of that because I found it interesting that they're saying in the future, we're going to require this for all new human users. Well, if you're going to do that, I thought to myself, like, why not just make it, why not just make it the default setting? And if the customer decides to turn it off, they're on their own. You know, they make that decision. They make that conscious decision. It's up to them. You're kind of in the clear snowflake. Um, I don't know. I go back and forth on it. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the thing is that like Av, as two people who like we don't really work uh in the weeds mm. at, at, on, at a security organization we just cover it um you know it is easy for us to sort of um say well shouldn't it be better um but the thing that i keep coming back to is if i ran snowflake do i know for a fact that I would do things differently. Yeah. And I don't have a good answer to that question. Yeah. Because it this the way they're doing things here could be way worse. For is, sure. Is, and and to at least make it the standard going forward is like, well, it shows a little bit of care there. Yeah. Um, no, for, for sure. Even more than a little bit of care. But at the same time, uh Dustin Childs of of Trend Micro Zero Day Initiative, the, what he told me is like, hey, uh if you make MFA optional, uh most people aren't gonna yeah. uh, enable it. And and so it's like I'm in this situation where I can't really finger wag at Snowflake at all because 
I feel like I see good intentions here. Right, right. But you and I both kind of see the future in which a lot of those customers are not going to allow their admins or 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 give their admins permission to make MFA mandatory. And so even though Snowflake has granted that ability and is promoting it, I mean, they're pro- that is a big part of this and good for them. Mm-hmm. You do see a world, like I said, in which those customers, a, a, a significant number of customers are not going to take that step. And this gets into something that I think is interesting. It came up time and time again at the AWS Reinforced show last month um, in interviews that I did and discussions I had with various folks over there was just this idea of, you know, they, they, they've been pretty aggressively rolling out required MFA for cloud instances, especially, you know, starting with like the highest level of privilege and trying to work their way down. And, you know, they've said that they know that that's going to, you know, maybe upset some people or it's not what people want, but they really think it's important. And, you know, the point I've been making is kind of like you're you're essentially protecting the customers for them from themselves. You know, you're you're applying the security that they should be doing on their own. You're taking that initiative. You're taking on that part of the shared responsibility. And they see that as good good business. And I I I guess I have to agree because you you just don't you hear about stuff all the time, or you used to hear stuff all the time about folks with S three buckets accidentally exposing them without you know, um, password protection or any type of access control. And there's data out there for the whole world to see. And and people beat up on, beat up, criticized AWS for, you know, hey, why is this happening? Why are so many S3 buckets exposed? Like what's going on? How come customers don't know what they're doing? You guys didn't need to make this clear. To their credit, you don't hear about that stuff as much anymore. And they've even gone further by starting to roll out these MFA requirements. And I guess they can do that because they're AWS and because they have so many customers and they are the the cloud giant. And maybe in Snowflake's position, you can't do that sort of thing. You can't go that big and that aggressive. Um, But I don't know. Maybe they should. I mean, I guess we'll see because we we're you know we're of the same mind here, right? We don't think these are going to be the last attacks that are going to hit Snowflake customers. Correct. So let let's let's play this out. If if there's six months a year from now, there's another series of attacks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, same type of thing. Who do we blame there? I mean, to me, I start with the customer because these attacks have been widely publicized. And you look at a company like AT&T, having that volume of data, that those type of sensitive records out there in a database that did not have MFA, I mean, that's, that's a terrible look right off the bat. And if it happens to another company or several other companies down the road after we knew what happened with these attacks... I, I don't think I don't think Snowflake's going to be to blame. I think you can say, hey, maybe they should have done a little more. Maybe they should have required it. Maybe they should have set, like I said, my position would be set it by default and make the customers turn it off if they don't want it. Mm-hmm. But what's your take on that? I generally agree with you. Um, there's, the, I don't know if I'd call it conspiracy brain to, to think this, but Given the the quality of victims we're getting here, and I don't mean quality like good, I just mean like it's big victims, right? Um, AT and T, you know, Neiman Marcus, uh, allegedly, so some yep. some other big um companies. Um, right now it looks like Snowflake isn't really to blame. They're doing all the right things. They're being transparent. Uh, they engaged Mandiant and CrowdStrike, and and if you're engaging both of them, Mandiant's not probably not going to lie for you. CrowdStrike's probably <laughs> not going to lie for you, right? No. But the quality of the victim here still makes me wonder if there's some 
detail here that we're missing mm. that makes Snowflake a little more culpable than the messaging has made them see. Is that too is that too conspiracy brained? It's not conspiracy brained. I mean, there's a lot of people that have wondered how so many number one, how how so many big customers like I just said, AT&T, how do you not have any type of like MFA or 2FA on a on a database that has that kind of volume and and sensitivity of of records? Because you're not just talking about like the AT&T wireless customers. You're talking about all the people that they called too. That's not great. That's mm-hmm. like, you can tell a lot. I mean, I don't need to lecture on this. We've known this ever since the Snowden revelations. Like, you can determine a lot from call records. And there were numerous people talking about the national security risks that are posed by having those calls exposed. Well, it, either the attackers like did a lot of recon and targeted very specific companies and found very specific companies that did not have uh, the the appropriate account protections on the snowflake instances or yeah maybe there's some there could be something more to this there could i mean right now it's it's being attributed to info stealer malware that has gotten on various people's systems and collected credentials and we know that that happens a lot so it's it, this it isn't like this is some elaborate solar winds type hack um and I know, you know, obviously the initial reporting on this attributed it to to Snowflake and said that they were breached internally, which, you know, I'm sure made sense to a lot of people. But now, as we know, that that, you know, that early reporting in the Hudson Rock threat intel firm report has been, well, I guess we can say it's been refuted. It's been taken down and I guess refuted. So you may be right. Um, but... I, I think in the in the absence of additional information, I, I you know what are the, what's the saying? Don't don't um, attribute stuff to malice that could be attributed to stupidity. Um, yeah, and and there's there's the I'm also someone who who believes that like often the most boring answer is the is the uh correct one whatever the most boring thing is is probably the reason and the most boring thing here is look snowflake is one of those extremely successful companies that if you don't work in technology you probably have never heard of right um it has a lot of big customers because it does a really specific thing that it does really well apparently um and it didn't enable MFA by default, and yeah. I, although there although options existed, I believe yeah they point. did. It's not like they there did. was none, right? Um, and so their success was basically the the crime they're most guilty of. Yeah, <laughs> and and so it's basically being guilty of the same, uh, not enforcing MFA that that so many other organizations are currently doing right plus being so successful and having so many large scale customers which is what they as a as a uh database provider that that serves a lot of large companies yeah Fortune 500 whatever right it, it was it could have just been a a really unfortunate recipe yes i was just about to say it seems like a recipe for prime cyber criminal activity for hacking uh just having that type of of offering snowflakes offering and knowing the, the type of clientele they're probably attracting uh and you know gambling on the idea that some of these guys are not going to they're probably not putting all like all of their data or what they consider to be ultra sensitive data they may just be putting some sensitive data in a database here and there and maybe they're just doing it quickly and they don't have mfa and you know you're off mm-hmm. to the races um let's let's talk about the threat actors for a minute let's talk about the ransom so reports came out uh i believe it was wired that first reported this this week uh that the shiny hunters shiny yes unc whatever five five was it five five three seven 
that they had received a Bitcoin payment of a 5.72 Bitcoin or the equivalent of about $373,000. Mm -hmm. uh, that the threat actors received this to a crypto controlled wallet that apparently the threat group um, uh, owned or controlled. Uh, and that has been um, not confirmed. I, at and has not confirmed this, but according to sources and according to um, some experts that Wired talked to, this was transmitted uh, in the aftermath of the attack of the breach against at and And uh, I guess an independent security researcher who assisted or facilitated the communications between the threat group and at and or at and negotiators confirmed that, yes, this was a, a ransom payment from at and to delete that data. And that the hackers initially demanded a million, but at and ended up paying about a third of it, a little more than a third. So, Alex, what do you think of that? I know, um, I know, I know what you think of it because we slacked about this. Um, but oh, well, so as an aside, I'm I'm very curious if Shiny Hunters is a uh, Pokemon reference because that's a uh, that's a way people play Pokemon is, is yeah. they hunt for for so so a, a lot of video game references in the cybercrime community. Mm. So that's the first thing that stood out. The second thing is that. Um, 18 370,000 is like what one and a half mid level executives at AT&T salaries it's it's like it's nothing to them um probably um which makes me now this is maybe conspiracy theory or cynical brained whatever um but my immediate thing as soon as i saw that they paid 300 whatever thousand to to this gang is oh they're just doing this in the hopes that their fine will be less whenever the government comes after them i thought about that i did um i don't know i don't know that the, that the deletion is going to save them mm -hmm. uh because because the 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 data was oh, exposed not um, save them it's more like another bullet point whenever they will have to pay a fine to to basically say well here's yeah. one more thing they did to protect customer data yeah. they did all they can so it's basically so we'll we'll make you pay 10 million instead of 15 million yeah. which will be impossible to quantify but i think they're 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 trying to spend 300,000 up front in order to save millions of dollars later is my theory yeah no i i i get you and i think i agree because I can just picture a world where, you know, there's an, there's a, you know, FTC hearing or there's a, a hearing before Congress. And you can imagine that unfolding in a way that is, is less, less intense and confrontational. If mm -hmm. they say, Hey, the deleted the, or the date has been deleted and you don't have you know numerous privacy violations you don't have data um out there being dissected on the dark web that's connecting government officials and putting you know national security risks out there so i think i think you're 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 on to something there um and i i, I hate saying this but i guess if you're at t and the the number is that small why not do it? I mean, the why the why not do it, I would answer is because it's probably not deleted. They probably retained a record of it somewhere. They know how valuable it is. And don't give me this crap about how they're operating as a business and they need to establish trust. They're crooks. You know, mm -hmm. they're cyber criminals, they're crooks. They are not to be trusted. We are we've been through this countless times at this point where we know threat groups like this, cyber criminal groups like this, do not delete all of the data. They may do it in some cases, but we've already been confronted head on with some examples where we know that, for example, Lockbit kept copies of, of victim data. So I don't know. Um, 
I I do think it's it's interesting that you know I've always wondered like why why are we sort of permitting companies to make ransom payments when they're not actually hit with ransomware and it's just mm -hmm. data but I guess in this case like you have to consider it just because of 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 how sensitive that data is and how many people it affects and what it could be used for and how if it fell into the wrong hands how it could be used to I don't I don't know it could be used by other threat actors to extort people like what like what if you like you know just going back to like the Ashley Madison hacks and things like that what if you found some numbers on there that were connected to like really really numbers that are going to open up a lot of sensitive questions about that individual and you know, we we've seen this happen with the what was it the the Dutch um, psychotherapy clinic that was hacked years ago. The threat actor extorting people and pressuring people, pressuring individuals explicitly for payment. I mean, that could that could be really bad. Mm -hmm. So, I get why they did it. I guess I just, I just this is trending in a direction that is not good to me um, sure so and then i compare it to like what happened with the cdk in a cdk the the uh company that was recently with ransomware hugely disruptive ransomware attack they serve the automotive industry um uh, basically a technology platform that a lot of uh, uh car, car dealerships use and uh apparently this also just broke recently uh, I believe it was last week, CNN reported that CDK also paid a ransom. Now, in this case, it's a little different because they were hit with like real ransomware and not just, you know, this isn't just data theft. Uh, they were hit with uh, hit by a threat actor affiliated with the Black Sea ransomware gang. They paid 387 Bitcoin, which is roughly 25 million. So, yeah. Uh, what do you think of that comparison? I don't even know how you get a hold of 25 million in Bitcoin. Like, logistically, that sounds unimaginable. Yeah. Like, not impossible, I'm sure, if, if sure. you're a big company. But but that's, that's like a scale of buying cryptocurrency in such a volatile market that I can't even imagine what it took to procure that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was thinking yesterday was, oh, that reads like they didn't negotiate at all. I don't know I, if that's true, but I don't know. that's 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 how it because it, it felt like the type of thing where they would have taken ten million. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe right. Yeah, I, it's weird. Um, just the the discrepancy or the the gap, I guess, between these two payments. And again, we're talking about you know a situation where one involved ransomware, where you know systems are completely down and and so on and so forth, and obviously this one is a little different um i don't know i i look at this and i think to myself like they they had so much disruption it reminds me of change healthcare mm -hmm. they had so much disruption and so many headaches caused by this attack i it's not clear to me when they made it um it says it says june 21st it looks like the cryptocurrency According to CNN story is when the the payment was transmitted. So, I, but you know they're they're dealing with disruption for the last few weeks. It's like it's okay they paid, but like didn't seem like it helped recovery time that much. And same with the change healthcare attack. It's like that happened, but and they paid, but that went on for so long. It felt like mm -hmm. so I don't know. I it just seems like you paid 25 million and for you could have, yeah. For what? Right. Not to be mean about this, but uh, I mean, I guess we'll I probably, mean, this is a company. This isn't some guy pulling out his wallet, but sure. Sure. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm sure the, the breach coach cyber insurance company were involved, but you know, to your point, like you're kind of wondering like, okay, what did they demand? And did this nego did get negotiated down to something more manageable if you can even call 
25 million manageable. I guess, I, you know, I don't know what the, the valuation for CVK is, what their annual revenue is, but my goodness, that's, that's a pretty significant amount. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, you know, this goes back, I want to mention this before we wrap up, this goes back to just this idea that, you know, I, I, I know there's been research recently that, 2023, you know, not as many people paid ransoms. And we have, we've had a number of like cybersecurity reports from various vendors that looked at the landscape and said, actually, you know, hey, payments are down a tick, you know, ransomware activity is up or extortion activity is up, but ransoms themselves or the overall number may have dipped a little. It's like, great. But then you look at stuff like this and, you know, especially the AT&T one where they have to like basically get a third party security researcher or hacker to like facilitate this stuff. And it just feels like this stuff is getting more and more codified into business practices through insurance, legal. Then you, like you mentioned the, the whole, you know, regulatory calculus, like, should we pay to like lessen the blow here? I think we need to start having a conversation about is, is this all leading in a direction where people are just going to pay more? They're just going to be making more payments. And this is just part of like business in the 21st century. I don't know. Well, there's a, there are a million different, um, as we wrap this up, I guess. I I think what we're talking about could be an even deeper conversation about what's going to happen with incident response costs. Mm. Um, cause we, we might be looking at $20 million and going, oh, that's a lot of money. We might be looking at $500,000, $5 million. And what we're not seeing is the downtime. What we're not seeing is sure. what it takes to make sure the, 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 the networks are secure and all that. And, and so if we're in this perpetual arms race of threat actors getting better and defenders getting better and the targets getting bigger and the targets networks having things like AI uh, set up in it, which is all very expensive and, and sometimes proprietary. Mm -hmm. Does all this lead to even crazier, more bloated incident response costs? Mm -hmm. And, and, and so we might be saying, Oh, why did they pay 20 million? It could be because, well, they were scared of paying a hundred million or something. Ugh, yeah. I, yeah. I, and I don't, I don't know, but that's just, those are the things I think about. <laughs> yeah. You may be right. You may be right. Uh, but let's leave it there because sure, I think we've covered a lot. Uh, we will be continuing to cover the snowflake attacks, the at t situation, uh, all of this stuff as more information comes to light. Uh, mm-hmm. but we'll, we'll leave it there for now. Alex, thank you so much for joining me in this discussion. You bet. And thank you to the readers and listeners of Tech Target and the Risk and Repeat podcast. I'm Rob Wright, and we'll see you next time.